This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Cassidy. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the start of the Passion Week. My father, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy, referred to this week as the week that changed the world. Indeed, the cross of Jesus Christ stands at the very center of human history. But what are God's reasons for the cross? On today's special Kennedy Classics, leading theologians and ministers share the incredible love of God as seen in the death of his dear son for our salvation in this documentary presentation, The Cross of Christ, hosted by John Sorensen. There is controversy surrounding the cross of Jesus Christ today. Some hate the cross, some love the cross, but we know that the cross is ultimately the only thing in which we can really place our hope. The cross of Jesus Christ symbolizes the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. We're all born in sin, and therefore every one of us needs the cross to be redeemed. Our society is desperately in need of the message of the cross. Welcome to this special Holy Week edition of Kennedy Classics. I'm John Sorensen, President of Evangelism Explosion International, the ministry Dr. Kennedy founded to train Christians around the world to effectively share their faith with others. During this special time of year, the week that changed the world, we're going to stop for a few minutes to look inside the most important event in all of human history. What does it mean that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins? What happened on that cross? And why does it matter to you? Sadly, most people don't understand it. And even many Christians miss the fullness of joy, peace, and security that God intends for us because we don't understand the fullness of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Stay tuned. You're about to experience Christ in a deeper way and understand more fully what He did for you. The cross has always been controversial simply because it is the emblem of Christianity and why would you use that for your logo of all things, an instrument of torture? And yet it's one of the earliest Christian symbols. The cross was an instrument of death, a horrible instrument of torture. In the time of Jesus wearing a cross around your neck would have been in our culture akin to wearing a, an electric chair around your neck. The early Christians would never have chosen the cross as their symbol if it all ended on the cross. We're all born in sin, and therefore every one of us needs the cross to be redeemed. Critical scholars who want to reject the, the doctrine of the atonement are, are indeed rejecting the, what is central to, to the Christian faith. While uh, the critics and the unbelievers and the apostate church uh, say that the cross is primitive, uh, shedding of blood is, uh, is primitive. Uh, we believe, like the Apostle Paul said, it is to us is none other than the power of God unto salvation. The cross of Christ is now a familiar symbol. We wear it around our necks, we put it on bumper stickers, but it was once much different. As you're about to see, at the time of Christ, a cross was a horrible and scandalous thing. When you look at all four Gospels, you realize that about one-third of their content deals with the last week of Jesus' life. In other words, really the passion and resurrection of our Lord, where He died for us in our place. Now, one aspect of that passion was when He was scourged. Isaiah 53, written 700 years before Christ, talks about, by His stripes we are healed. Now, scourging involved taking a leather whip, and then it was used to flagellate 
the prisoner. And it had to be done very carefully because it could actually kill the prisoner. The scourging prior to crucifixion was a real gruesome operation. Uh, they had little bits of bone that were sharpened, uh, little pieces of metal spikes, nails that were included in the scourge. And so a person was fairly well lacerated, there's no question about it. As a matter of fact, the Romans called that the little death prior to the death and crucifixion. Then the Romans made him carry his cross as he made his way through the Via Dolorosa, the Way of Sorrows. And then they brought him to Calvary where they crucified him. So he arrives. Calvary. They strip him of his garments. You can imagine the blood from the, the scourging dried and stuck to the garments and opening those wounds again as they, they rip them off. They cast lots as the scripture had foretold. And they nail him to the cross and they, they raise it up. It was the most painful way to die. You would rather be mauled by animals or stoned or anything than be crucified. The nails went through here and that causes the thumb to jerk in because of the nerve that's being pinched there as the nail would go through there. Asphyxiation is probably the cause of death because you simply can't breathe. When you're hanging on the cross long enough, you finally can't get your breath anymore because there's no fulcrum in which to hold your body together to, to draw that breath. And Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was hung on that cross for six hours. It was horrific. People did not talk about the cross in polite conversation. Uh, you didn't sit around your dinner table and discuss the latest crucifixions, uh, much in the same way that lynchings would be in our understanding. But you didn't talk about lynching around the table with your children. And so the cross, to them would be akin to lynching to us. Clearly things were not right with the universe when the Son of God was hanging on the cross. In fact, the sun was darkened, and that's where we get the phrase darkness at noon. As if heaven is mourning the fact that the creator of the sun and that the creator of light is now hanging on a cross and it became dark. And the darkness fell upon this entire area to tell that this is the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. And so when he was on the cross, it became dark. In John's Gospel, it says that the Roman soldiers went to the thieves on both sides of Christ, and they broke their knees. Then when they came to Christ, they saw that he was already dead. So one of them took a spear and pierced his heart and immediately outflowed blood and water. They had to borrow a tomb. Somebody volunteered and says, I have a new tomb. You can bury him in my tomb. And he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, which was brand new. And it is befitting that the Lord of glory be buried in a brand new tomb because he wasn't going to be there for very long. And the third day he rose again with power and great glory and he was seen for over 40 days by hundreds of people, hundreds of people. He fellowshiped with the disciples. He fellowshiped with uh, the 72 and the 12 and the 500 eyewitnesses saw the risen Lord. A crucified Messiah is a false Messiah. Only Jesus is thought to be the true Messiah after he's crucified. That's a very strong argument for the resurrection because you have to answer the question what's different about Jesus from these other dozen messianic claimants who were also crucified what would cause followers to say yes he was still the Messiah despite the fact that he was crucified Jesus rose from the dead after he earned our salvation on the cross he came to give his life as a ransom for many he says that he came to lay down his life for his sheep. And so we can understand that Christ understood that his coming into the world was a coming to die for the sins, as it says in Matthew chapter 1, for the sins of his people. We call the day Christ was crucified Good Friday. Isn't that strange?
When you think about it, we're celebrating the execution of our Savior. How could such a thing be good? If Jesus were merely dragged to His death against His will, as some modern scholars have claimed, a mere victim of circumstance, it couldn't be good. But is it possible there is more to it than that? Let's take a closer look. Some skeptics have said, well, Jesus died as a martyr to His cause. That's not what happened. Jesus voluntarily laid down His life on our behalf. God hates sin. God poured out His wrath on His Son, Jesus Christ, when He was there on the cross. And the night before He was crucified, He contemplated what He was going to have to do on that Good Friday. So He goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it is there that He enters into prayer. And he has invited the disciples to pray with him, but they are too tired. They fall asleep, and so he is alone. And this is where he is in conversation with the Father and asks the Father if there's any other way to accomplish this mission. <laughs> Please take this cup away from me, he says, but not my will, but thine be done. So he is willing to submit himself, his whole being, to the Father's will and to do whatever it is going to take to accomplish the mission, which is to rescue us, <laughs> is to substitute for us. And he goes into that knowing it is going to be painful. In fact, he is so aware of how painful it is going to be that he, he sweats so profusely that it is as if blood were coming out. Our Lord kneeling in the garden, praying to his Father, sweating blood, such a, an intensity of emotion, of fervor, that his whole humanity united with his divinity, preparing to be immolated to his father. It was a, a powerful moment. And uh, at that point, it was only a few hours until he would die on the cross. They knew that. In this case, we have more than an earthly event taking place here. This is part of the divine drama of our salvation. This is only at the surface what is happening at a tremendous depth by which our salvation was accomplished by God in Christ. That is a cosmic difference between Jesus' death and all other deaths and all other martyrdoms that have taken place. Uh, Jesus had not only the physical agonies of uh, Good Friday, but he had also the burden of the sins of the world. It was a, a cosmic load that only God himself could have shouldered. And I think that's the, the larger significance of what's happening here on Good Friday. When Jesus was on the cross, he allowed the infinite wrath of God to be placed on him because he had become sin on our behalf. And because God hates sin, he broke fellowship with his son. God the Father rejected God the Son. And so Jesus cries out, quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I believe that he is crying out of his anguish at the experience that he is encountering at that moment as he's carrying the sins of the world. And what's amazing about that moment is he is carrying our forsakenness, what should have been our forsakenness. God should be turning his face away from us, but instead he's turning it away from Christ. And at that moment on the cross, as Jesus Christ carried on his holy shoulders the sins of the world and the rebellion and all of the things that we, the worst things we can think about, as those sins and man's rebellion were carried on his holy shoulders, the Father could not look upon sin. And that is that moment of separation for which he is born. That is the pain of the cross. That was the sacrifice of the cross. As you've heard from our experts, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ took our sins to the cross. But so what? That happened 2,000 years ago. What does it mean for us today? Was it a mere curiosity of history, or did something happen in Jesus' death and resurrection that affects things right now in your life and in mine?
Tetelestai is a Greek word that means it is finished. It's interesting that that's the word you hear Jesus crying from the cross. Tetelestai, it is finished. It is paid in full. That the debt that we owed that we could never pay, Christ has paid in full. The fact is that God is a lawgiver and we have broken his laws. All of our sins will, will be punished. And the question is whether they're punished in, in Christ or whether we will experience their punishment. Every sin will be punished. It is either punished on the cross or it is punished in everlasting hell. Will we accept the punishment that God lays upon his son or will we assume that punishment for ourselves? There's an old analogy used by some of the church fathers that compares the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life and the Tree of the Cross. And the Tree of Life and the Garden must have looked very appealing to Adam and Eve. But the true Tree of Life is the one not that grew in Eden, but the one that was raised up on Calvary. In the postmodern culture, of course, what is happening a lot of so-called evangelicals are using the grace of God as a license. There are churches filled with young people who are living immoral lives and, uh, and, and, and they'll be drunk on Saturday night and uh, before they're leaving the party they said, hey, which uh, service are you going to go to? That is presuming on God. You see, until we understand the enormity of sin, do we appreciate the forgiveness of God. Now, what set Christ's death apart from any other death? What made his so special? Was it the suffering? Was it that he suffered physically worse than anybody else? No, it was because of who he was. And Anselm, who's writing in the end of the 11th century, is the one that is given the credit for really setting out in a carefully reasoned way why it was that Jesus was the only one who could be the one to step in and take the place of humanity. And he argued in his Cur Deus Homo, which is why the God man, that it had to be someone who was both God and human. There's only one who could pay that infinite price, and that's the one who is infinite himself, God. And so God himself becomes man, God himself walks among us, and God himself bears the punishment that we deserve for our sins. He dies on the cross in our place so that we might have life, so that we might indeed be united with him forever. Suppose that you were to die today. Do you know assuredly that you would be united with Almighty God? If he were to say to you, what right do you have to enter into my heaven, what would you say? If Christ is not the person that you're trusting in for your hope of eternal life, then you have no hope at all. I would urge you to invite him into your heart, to place your trust in Christ alone for your salvation, and then you will know beyond the peradventure of a doubt that you're going to be forever in heaven. Heaven is unearned, unmerited, unworked for. It's absolutely a free gift. Do you have that gift? If you do, you know it. Christ said, he that trusts in me already has eternal life. Would you like to trust in him? If so, then bow your head and pray with me this prayer right now. Lord Jesus Christ, divine Savior, Son of God, come into my life, I pray right now. I invite you to take over my life. I place my trust in you. I believe that you died in my place and paid the penalty for my sins. I surrender myself to you. I thank you for giving me the gift right now of everlasting life. Help me henceforth to follow you in thy name. Amen. I hope you prayed that prayer with me. And if you did, we'd like to send you a book written by Dr. Kennedy entitled Beginning Again. In it, you'll learn the basics of the Christian life, how to pray, how to read and study the Bible, even how to share your faith with others. We want you to have Beginning Again. So write to us or call our toll free number. You can also go online to truthinaction.org. God bless you. 
Dr. D. James Kennedy had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and as you're about to see, the life of this young dance instructor was changed forever. I grew up being sent to a Sunday school and church, and when I got to be about 13 or 14, and uh, old enough to make a loud enough squawk, well, my parents stopped sending me. I went through a period of about uh, nine or 10 years where I rarely went to church at all, maybe on Easter on a good year, but that was about all. I had no real interest in spiritual matters. I had never learned anything in church that really uh, appealed to me or grasped my attention. I had never understood or heard the gospel. And one thing I loved to do was to dance. And so when I was in college, I applied for a job uh, teaching dancing at Arthur Murray. And he became a dance instructor and was quite good at it and became even a manager of one of the Arthur Murray dance studios in the Tampa area. And I was sleeping in one Sunday morning when I heard a radio broadcast and what had been music the night before was a preacher that morning. Suppose that you and I should go out of this building and a swerving automobile should come up on the sidewalk and kill the two of us. You are going to meet God. And if in this next minute God should say to you, what right, and note my emphasis on the word, what right do you have to come into my heaven, what would be your answer? Perhaps and so I, I listened, and for the first time in my life I heard the gospel. I heard the incredible good news of the free offer of eternal life through Jesus Christ, and that how his death was the payment for my sins, and that he had purchased for me a place in heaven that if I would receive him into my life and trust him as my Savior and Lord, that I could be forgiven and have eternal life. Well, my initial response was that was too good to be true. So we went to a newsstand and he said, do you got any religious books? And he told me one time, I shudder to think now what I might have received. What I actually received was the greatest story ever told by Fulton Ausler. I stayed home each night and read a part of that in the following Saturday night. I completed the book and slipped onto my knees there in my room and invited Jesus Christ into my life as Savior and Lord. And my life has never been the same since that day. And he then went on to transform the lives, literally, of millions of people through his radio, television, his writings, and his one-on-one -on -one evangelism training that's gone out into all the world. It should be the, the great passion and zeal, the consuming vision of our heart that Jesus Christ might be known throughout all of the earth and we can make a difference. Dr. D. James Kennedy is an excellent example of a life transformed by Christ once he understood what Jesus had done for him at the cross. Thank you for joining me on this special Holy Week examination of the hope and power of the cross of Christ. We look forward to your continuing partnership as we proclaim the world-changing, life-changing good news to a lost and dying world. May the Lord bless you as you reflect on the passion of our Lord and Savior this week and as you celebrate His glorious victory over death and sin on Easter Sunday. The world will never understand it, but those of us who are in Christ know that without that cross, we are doomed for eternity. On the cross, Jesus fought against evil. And on the cross, Jesus paid the debt for sin that we could never pay. No person could ever have lived a perfect life like God demanded. God himself had to do it. He suffered the penalty we should have suffered. This is the basic heart of the Christian message. There are three words that every human being wants to hear. You are forgiven. On the cross, Jesus Christ paid a price that he didn't owe, but it's a price that we could never pay. And if we trust in him and his finished work on the cross, we will be saved. What an amazing truth. 
that God sent his only son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. As you've seen on today's special program, Jesus suffered beyond anything you and I can imagine, and he did it on our behalf. Not only that, but it was absolutely voluntary on his part. As Jesus himself said, nobody took his life from him. Instead, he freely laid it down. The events of that week 2,000 years ago are the climax of the greatest story ever told. What was it like to be there? What must have been going through the minds of the people involved? We have an exciting new resource to help you discover that and more. It's the brand new seven DVD set, Personalities in the Passion, reliving the greatest drama in the history of the world. This set of powerful, thought-provoking messages from the late Dr. D. James Kennedy has never been offered before, and it's only available through Truth in Action Ministries. In it, Dr. Kennedy brings all of his preaching and storytelling abilities to bear in looking at the death and resurrection of Jesus through the eyes of the participants in the events, including Simon Peter, Doubting Thomas, Pontius Pilate, and even Judas. These messages bring the Passion Week to life and we want to send you this new 7 DVD set when you give a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. To receive Personalities in the Passion, simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. You'll want to have these messages for your own collection and to share them with others. Whether you can give $30 or $1,000, every donation helps us continue to broadcast the life-changing truth of the gospel and the culture-transforming Word of God. Again, simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677 or go online to truthinaction.org and request your copy of Personalities in the Passion. My father loved delivering these messages and they've had a powerful impact. I know you'll love watching them and discovering anew what happened during that Holy Week in Jerusalem that changed the world. Please contact us today with your generous donation. And may God bless you as you do. And may God bless America. A video of today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. So please call, write, or log on to our website today. Next week on Kennedy Classics. The Prince of Life was in mortal combat with the King of Terrors, death itself. That's next week. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.